we stop somewhere here, right? The, we talk about the lambda where for the smoothing spline, so we want the larger the lambda, the smoother the g will be. Right. From here onwards, for me, like the equation gets really confusing, so I'm not sure like what is going on. Oh, hi, Nile. Good to have you here today. Then um, they talk about how we want to choose the smoothing parameter. So uh, one of it is because the lambda controls the roughness of the spline. So one way we can look at it is the degree of freedom, which is the effective degree of freedom. I think we ended here where we talk, we stopped here where did we talk about how the degree effective degree of freedom decreases from n and finally adds at two, right? I think this is where we stopped last week. Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> oh, there's a cute cat. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um so um, what else? Huh? Let me check my notes. <laughs> then I'm not sure what else. Like to I was looking at this one. Um, where they didn't really discuss even in the notes. They didn't really discuss about the spine. And they only talk about, like, they go, didn't go into details the math of the equations part. So they just go look into the, what's the definitions of cubic spine, the natural cubic spine, and the smoothing spine. I think this one will all make more sense as we go through the lab exercises later on today. And for... The final one, we did not talk about the local regressions. So local regression is just a more different approach where we have a few nearby, nearby observations, then you try to compute a fit at the target, which they call it XO or something called. Um, so x at the data point. So you try to compute a fit using only the nearby training observations. Then I find interesting as in this one, the figure that they talk about, where if you look at the left panel and the right panel, on the left panel is somewhere like the x is approaching zero. Whereas this one is somewhere near the 0 0.4. Okay. Then the orange color one points are just all those local points to the target. Then you have this, what's the blue line? Represents a bit. The blue line represents something. Ah. The blue line is the functions where we have our data out and the orange line is the local regression estimates. This one I find if you just look at the summary, <laughs> then it makes more sense. So what they were doing with the local regressions is where we gather a fractions of, they have something called the span where you take k divided by n, the number of data, to, then to get the training points. Then you assign a weight of k to each point in the neighborhood. So for me, I think it is like really like the k nearest neighbor, where the points furthest away from the x will have zero weight. So anything nearer will have a higher weight. Then they fitted a weighted list square regressions then minimizes this k value, then you have this fitter value, then you get x. So back to this one, just now I forgot to mention what is s. So s stands for the span, 
which is the proportions of points used to compute the local regressions at x, means the nearer the data point. Um, so what it say is when you have a smaller value of s, means it's more local, so your fit will be more weakly because you're trying to fit the s close one. But then if you have larger S, you will have a more global fit because you're using all the training observations. Then I forgot to mention one thing. <laughs> Let's just go back a bit. We also have, remember, we talk about cross-validation in chapter five. So when we're talking about this smoothing spine, one of it is they can we can use this more method, which is the cross validation. Okay, using cross validation, if you look at this diagram, you have two. One is the red lines are the with sixteen degrees of freedom, and the blue one is just using the cross validation method, the leaf one up one. Um, this one you get about six point eight degree of freedom. What is try they trying to say is both will get about the same fit. You will see like both are predicting about the same. And in this case, where you will get this about the same, uh, same type of output, then we would want to pref we prefer to use the one with less degree of freedom, which is this, the one with the cross validation method for the smoothing spine. So for smoothing spine, when you use this, uh, uh, cross. So you want to use this leave one out method because you can compute it more efficiently, it seems that for the smoothing spine. So then is the, it has the same purpose where you just want to find the smallest RS, RSS as possible. Mm -hmm. What else? Huh? Then that's the main point. <laughs> Uh, okay. Then GM is the more, I think this is the one that I'm not familiar with other methods, but I find GM is more the familiar one. So you can still use it, just um, it's like regress linear model. Just that this one is for non-linear, and but you can still use it for quantitative and qualitative response. So you can do it both ways. So they first talk about how you can use it on the rich data. So um, what is good about GAM is it's addictive. So you can use different methods to predict basic method, uh, how do I say? You can use different functions to predict. <laughs> so one of it is we can calculate for GAM, we can calculate a separate functions for each of the predictors, then we add together all their contributions. So one way, if you can look at it here, the diagram or the figure, so we are trying to predicting the wage. So we will have three functions. Then one of it we're using year, age, and education. So for year and age, we are using a natural spine to predict. So this one is with four degree of freedom, the first one on the left panel, and the middle panel will have a five degree of freedom, 5DF. And the third one is we're using a step function. So we're using different functions just to predict each of the predictor. Then we add on this. The education one, we're using the step function one of it because it's a qualitative variable as well. So you have like five levels to the variable. Uh, so this is addictive, the basic addictive functions for GM is you add on the plus plus three functions together with your intercept. Uh, so if we interpret this figure, what you can see is 
when the age and the education is kept constant, what we realize as, as the years increases, the wage also increases, which makes sense because of inflation. As the year increases, your wage should increase as well due to inflation. For the meter one, um, as the year and the education are kept constant. So if you fix it, the age, uh, they seem to earn a lot when they are like middle age, somewhere around like 40 to 50s. So you earn lesser when you're younger and you also earn lesser when you're older. Then for education wise, the standard errors, everything is still quite minimum. Um, what happened here is uh, the higher your education is, if you keep the year and the age constant, the higher your level of education, the more that you earn. So means education does help to improve your wage. The next one is when we use, earlier we using this one is we use a natural spline for this figure 7.11. But for 7.12, we are using smoothing spline. So the first one has four and the middle one has a five degree of freedom as well. So same thing as the year increases, the wage also increase, and they seems to earn a lot more around like 40 to 50 when they work. But for this one, the education one, it also seems that they earn a lot more when they are more educated. What else? Uh? Ah, then we have this thing called backfitting. So backfitting is where you have uh, multiple predictors. So you're trying to predict the fit for each predictors while we're holding the other fix, which was how I explained it. So while you're trying to, like for this one, the first figure, while keeping the age and education constant, you try to predict, see how years predicts the which. Uh, okay. Then they end with, this is the final part, JM. So they're trying to summarize the advantage and disadvantage of limitations of GAM. So one is JM allows us to fit nonlinear models, obviously. So uh, then because it's active, so you can add on different functions to it. Then they say nonlinear probably or potentially can make more accurate predictions. And because the model is addictive, we can it's examine the effects of each X on Y individually while holding the other variables fixed. Then we can also look at the smoothness of the functions and we can summarize it via the degrees of freedom. The main limitation is because it is addictive, so you might miss out a lot of, of important interactions compared to what you can do with the linear models. Um, but he said like linear models, we can add interactions effects as well if you, and by including additional predictors, I say you can cross the predictors together, then you can get the interaction effects. Uh, anyone else want to add on anything? No, then I'll talk about the GAM, how previously we talked about how we can use it for uh, qualitative, oh, sorry, quantitative uh, response. So you can also use GAM for quantitative like classification problems. So to keep it simple, what they did was here, they separate those which into those who earn above 250,000 
per year annually and versus those who earn lesser than 250. So we try to keep it simple like zero and one. So it's a binary response. So from this figure, you can see that when you keep the age and education constants, the year doesn't really affect the amount of wage that you earn, whether you are above 250 or below 250. Okay. But what is interesting is the last panel on the right. You will see that for this level, to know what HS, if this is education, then it's less than HS means high school, people, probably. High school, right? Yeah. yeah. So people who, <laughs> like those who are like, have not graduated from high school, most likely to not earn 250,000 per year. So one way you can do is you remove this level. So think of it as an outlier. You can remove it like the level and I think that's, a, yeah. So just keep it to four levels. Then we try to interpret this. And we can see as the education increases, you tend to more likely to earn higher than 250. So it seems like the salary increases with higher education. Uh, same for age, nothing much. It's still like those in the middle age seems to earn the most compared to older or younger people. Next is, then they move on to the lab. I haven't gone through the lab, so bad with me. So the lab is, they're trying to look at nonlinear modeling. Uh, we're using the wage data. So first one is we try to fit a polynomial regressions and the step function. One way to do it is the LM model then instead of listing it, you, there are multiple ways to do the polynomial regression. So one is you can use this function poly, then you specify how many power, to which power that you want it, the index here. So four will be the, to the power of four. Or the other way, I think this is what you can use the i. So you start with the h, then i h to the power two, power to three, or power to four. What they actually recommend is using this poly because then you have less typing to do. And I didn't really get these powers because I was reading it very fast, but it seems that when you add the raw equals to t under the poly, that something changes. So you say it affects the coefficient estimates, but it will not affect the fitted value obtained. So um, yeah, the p-value is about the same. So when it's fit to one degree, two degree, the estimates definitely is different. Yeah, but uh, even the p value is different. So, okay, so <laughs> does anyone want to add on to why when we have the raw equal to true? it changes the coefficient estimates. But the results is still the same, isn't it? Because your p-value, yeah. Mm. So looking at the, the help documentation for the poly function, mm -hmm. um, there it says, um, so it returns a, a matrix with rows corresponding to points in X and columns corresponding to the degree, that attributes degree specifying the degrees of the columns. Um, and unless you use raw equals true, it gives you coefs, which contains the centering and normalization constants. So it sounds like if you do use raw equals true, 
it is not going to center and normalize um, before creating the the polynomial so, terms. Let me just so it means that if we have this poly, this is being centered for us. I think so. Um, I, I'm not sure, but we could <laughs> test it by by doing poly of scale of age. Mm. Um, and if we manually scaled age, then I think we should get the same results, whether we use raw equals true or the default, which is raw equals false. Mm. Well, um, but it does make sense because I'm seeing in the raw equals true results, the intercept is. is I found a stack overflow link that tries to explain what the raw does. You can share yeah. screen. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're sharing. Sure, I can. Yeah, you share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? <laughs> share my screen. Yes. Yeah, mm. so what he does is that he did it on the cast data set and then he mentioned that, mm. uh, where was it? Uh, he says that if you use the orthogonal one, then the, the dust over two only captures the quadratic part and not the linear part. So, so wait, huh? that is with raw equal to true or raw not equal to true, this one, capture the uh, when the raw is false, you get the orthogonal one, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so this, this is raw is false. Yeah, so they mentioned that it only captures the quadratic part. So I guess it tries to tell you like, like interest that this one only uses the square and nothing else. Whereas if you just put it the same and it, it might use the speed and then we might say this is not so useful because it also uses the speed as the information. Yeah, and that actually makes sense because if you mm -hmm. if you center and scale a linear term before taking the quadratic, then the linear and quadratic terms should be uncorrelated or orthogonal. But if you don't, then they probably will be correlated. Yeah, because I think if they are correlated, then you will overestimate the value of this and underestimate the value of this, oh. right? Mm. Well, if it, it depends on the type of sums of squares that we're using. And R usually does type one sum squares by default, right? No idea. Uh, that, uh, I know awesome. the ANUVA one is type one for ANUVA test. Um, but for, mm. well, let's see. Hmm. Let's move on with the yeah. discuss <laughs> this again if we have time. Uh, okay, so um what else? Um okay, so the first few parts will just look showing you how to do the polynomial regressions and the step functions. And they also is similar. So when you want to do the predicts, then they talk about how you can use the C bind as well. C bind is like column bind, I think. This is, yeah. So column bind where you have this predicts fit 
past two times. So this is just a way of how you want to calculate. Uh, then this part is just the codes for plotting the polynomial, the H versus the which. And as we just now have run, it's, it seems that you earn most when you're around 40s in the middle age. Um, that's all I went. At least I stopped here. Uh, I'm not sure about this Ma and Oma arguments. So this is my first time seeing this one as well. And it seems that they first have this prefix. Then where is the Oma and the Oh here. This is where they use it because I haven't seen this before. And I don't use this often as well. So this my Oma seems to control the margins of the plots. So it has nothing to do with our functions. It's just a way to plot. Uh, next one is I find here in performing the polynomial regressions, first we talk about we must decide on the degree of polynomials, right? One way is we use ANOVA test to test it. So you do it one by one. So you can have multiple data. So you fit from the most basic one. Then you can fit up what they did was they fit up to five degree. So to five. The polynomial is five. Then you compare using the ANOVA function. So as you can see, it's significant here, significant here, and from here onwards, it's not significant. So what we can conclude is this is one, two, three, four. So it seems that this one from here, this is significant means that quadratic seems to be a better model than linear. And this one, cubic seems to be better than quadratic but depends on your which level of confidence you want if you select 95 this is not significant so um, it seems that cubic is better than this quad to the power of four those poly four mm. degree for polynomials so but the thing is model 3 and model 4 if you look at this is I think it's the residual this is degree of freedom this is RSS I'm not sure but besides looking at the p value I think one good thing is we can look into the model fitness one you look at the AIC or BIC, that's usually what I do when I compare model. You can look at AIC and BIC and try to look at other indicators whether the model is a good fit. Because this one is really near to 0 0.05, so we don't know how much the model has that changes the fitness. So you might want to consider looking into that as well. Uh, what else? Uh? When they run the coefficient, I think here is just this is getting coefficient the summary. This one is square up, so means that this one most probably is a t, I think t statistics, right? Yeah, t statistics. So if you square out, you should get back your f statistics. Uh, I think this one is the same as well. Just that the first model seems to look at linear model education at age. Second one is education polynomial of age education poly. 
this is multiple regression, it seems. And it seems that this is also significant. So it seems that this third model, the fit dot three model is the best out of all. Okay. If they want to look at the task of predicting whether an individual earns more or less than 250, so this is a classification problem, um, you can use the family, you have to include the functions called family equals to binomial. I think we discussed about this when we were looking at the classification chapter. So you can use GLM. Then when you want more or lesser than 250, so if you write this way more than 250, then this one must be one. Then the polynomial, four. Then you have to specify binomial here. So, they say you need to put an I because so that we can evaluate whether it's a Boolean expressions true or false expressions. And so true will be one, false will be zero. So if it's more than 250, that's one. And after running the model, we run some predictions. Then we can calculate and we calculate confidence. Uh, uh, so it seems that by default, the prediction type for GLM is link. So it means you get the logic, the log odds. So if you get log odds, means we have to calculate differently. So you have this exponential of the fit divided by one plus exponential of the fit. Then Z bind is fit plus two times. Two times two. Prediction of fit. And minus times this one is similar to the previous one. one so I I think it's just the, um, that's the formula, right? How to calculate standard error. Yeah, so the getting the standard error, but um, you need to, because it's in log odds, if you want it in probabilities, you just have to convert from log odds to probabilities. Or like it says in the next box, if you want, you can actually get it to give you probabilities right from the beginning, if you do type equals response. Oh, so this is just doing like how they're doing. This is probably T, then the next one is like trying to calculate. Yeah, exactly. So you like, you get the standard error bands as log odds, and then you have to convert them Wait, to probabilities. Okay, okay then it makes sense. Yeah, so it's a little messy. Uh, but. Here, like what you mentioned earlier, it seems that we can just do the type equals to response, then we should be able to get the property straight away. Oh, interesting. So you, we can skip all these steps. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Which I would definitely <laughs> recommend. <laughs> so for, okay. that's really, the, the type equals response is really valuable when you're, whenever you're plotting like logistic regression stuff. <laughs> okay, so, um, so this is, Okay, so this is just the quotes on how to plot. So we just, it seems that still the same, those in the middle age seems to more likely to earn more than 250 per annum. Um, but towards the end is interesting where we have this huge variability when you pass 70. Mm. 
Mm. Okay, so the next part is about the step function. So for step functions, we have we have to use the cut, like they use table, then they put cut h into four. So you cut it into four, then you fit it as in which predicts by h using the step function, then we get the coefficient. So we separate into four parts. So when you use cut function, they will automatically pick the cutoff points for you. So it seems that they cut it off at 33.5, 49, and 64.5. But um, if you prefer, you can specify your own cutoff points using the break options. Um, so when we look at here, this, this is minus, minus, everything is significant. So everything is significant here for the H. Then next one, the spline is you need the library spline. And when we fit it, we use the BS function. Then we need to specify our knots. After the H, you need to specify the knots. And you also, after that, the model, you have the predict standard error true. So here they specify knots at three points, 25, 40, and 60. So this will give us at least six functions. Because cubic spine, they say with three knots, you will have about seven degree of freedom. So this one with three knots, we will have six basic functions. You can also use degree freedom option to produce a spine with knots at a uniform quantas, quantas of the data. Um, so if you choose to separate by quantiles or percentiles, you will get 33.8, 4.2, and 51. So you can specify here using this attribute if you want it separate by quantiles. You have to specify attribute. BSH degree of freedom six, then specify you want it the knots. To fit natural spine, you use NS function. Then you specify here, in this case, their degree of freedom is. So same thing, after fitting, you have this prediction. Then lines, lines. So this is how the plot looks like. This two is for the plots. So means either you use one is BS function. And another one, we have two, one is BS function. Then you have cubic spine. Then an S function is the natural spine. Uh, what else? Huh? That's not the BS. Mm. Ah, for smoothing spine. Mm. If you want smoothing spine, the option is smooth dot spline function. 
Mm, where is the model here? So smooth dot spline H, then which degree of freedom 60? CV is cross validation. So this one is with cross validation. Um, So they say in the first model, when you have smooth spine, your degree freedom 16, then after that, that leads to the value of lambda leads. The function determine which value of lambda leads to this 60 degree of freedom. But the second call, you select the smoothness by cross validation, And this results in lambda that will use 6.8 degree of freedom. So you can see they are about the same. The lines are very similar to one another. So one is just, you have two models. One is just with what you specify degree of freedom 16 and the other one where we have used this leave one out cross validation. Okay. Then to do local regression, we use loss function. Loss function is like this. Loss which h, then we need to specify our s. Span, you can specify 0 0.2 or 0.5. So you can see 0.2 is a bit weakly. 0.5 is more smooth, more global rather than local. And that's um, a proportion mm. of the data, right? So 0. 0.5 is using half of the data at a time and, and 0. 0.2 yeah. is using a fifth of the data. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Thank it's you. nearer to the fifth. GAM. So for GAM is additive, right? So you need to specify the functions for each predictor. So here for GM1, they want to predict which using natural spine for year and age. Then we treat the education as a qualitative predictor. So age, like previously we saw in the figure, the year we fit to four degree of freedom and H to five degree of freedom, then education just qualitative data. Um, we also, to use the S function, you need to make sure you load the library again. I haven't used this before, so I'm not familiar. If anyone wants to add on, please feel free to do so. Um, then the next one is, I think here is what they're trying to, this function is just trying to reproduce the figure that we saw earlier, where we predict three things, year, age, and education. It's similar here, this one is using, this is using an S natural spine. This one is using this S, which stands for the, uh, what's it called? Smoothing spine, right? Because we need to specify the S, the span. This one is smoothing spline. Then, oh, why this looks so different? <laughs> this looks so different from the one that we have in the book. But we can still see like years as years increases, the which is increasing as well. But in 2007, it's not like the one in the book has a smoother line. I feel like, but here it's just slightly dropped at 2007 and before it goes up a bit. H is about the same. Yeah, education is the same result as well. Mm. Yeah. I think that's because of the Y interval. 
yeah, here is nicer I see. You can see the year increases, the wage increases. This one is for the age, right? And education as well. So it's the same for GAM means when you're trying to predict education, you're keeping the year and the age constant. Instead of using generic plot function, they use using plot dot gen. Because from the first one, let's see, it's SH5 education, then year plus H5 plus education. And they compare the model M1, M2, where is M3? Ah. M3 is here. Year, age, education. So, the same thing, they have three models that are actually using different functions. And sorry, it's using the same functions, but they just add on more and more predictors. So the first one, the M1 one, they only have the age and education. Okay. M2, they have the age and education and also the year but the year is just using the normal linear. Part. Then the third one is you have the year, but with smoothing spine. So non-linear with four degree of freedom. And it seems that comparing these three models, one, two, three, and the second one is better than the first model. And the third one, no difference. So means this model seems to be the best one. So they find compelling evidence that GAM with linear function of year. So you just need to use linear function for year is better than GAM that includes the non-linear one, the one that including the smoothing spline. So what we can conclude for GAM is you can use a linear model, you can also use the non-linear model and when you add it to the general overall models. Then summary. Uh, I think I need time to digest this. <laughs> Gen year age education. No AIC is this one here. So since that all trees are important predictors, if you look at it. The formula all three the year age and education seems to predict which and normal for non-parametric effects which so the oh, we have conclusion here for the ANOVA for parametric effects p value that clearly demonstrates that year age educations they're all statistically significant um, even when only assuming a linear relationship. Then when you look at the non-parametric one, um, the p-values for year and age corresponds to the null hypothesis of a linear relationship versus an alternative for non-linear relationship. 
then P for the year, we seem to have a very large P values. So here, it seems to suggest that this is not significant. So it seems that for year, we not necessarily need a smoothing point. The linear function seems to be adequate. We are running out of time. Uh, then the final part is the interaction one. So interactions is you use an L functions. You create the own interactions using the gem, gm, and then you still have these interactions between these two. I think this is the interactions of year and age. Uh, So we fit it by using the local regressions. Then I don't know what is this library here, but it's a 3D one where you plot this year versus the interaction here. Then to do logistic regressions where you want binary data, you make sure you put a family equals to binomial, then you use the I function as well to construct binary response. Then it seems that because here remember the gaps, the variability is a lot. So it seems that as long as you earn, you do not have a high school degree. If you did not graduate from high school, you will not earn more than 250,000 per year. I think, yep, that's all I have. <laughs> Sorry for the major interruptions because I really underprepared. <laughs> Anyone else have questions? No, if but I no... just want to say thank you. <laughs> thank you for um, <laughs> you know running us through that. I, I appreciate it. It's been very helpful. Yeah. I think no one else signed up for deep learning that chapter. So if no one else signed up for that, I think I'll try to do that as well. I think it's right after Jeremy. So I have about two weeks to prepare for that chapter. Oh, I think there's still one more chapter after mine. Oh, who is after you? <laughs> it's you next week, isn't it? Uh, let me remember the schedule. Well, there's a support vector machines before you go to deep learning first. Oh, yeah. There's two chapters. <laughs> yeah, I can try to do like either one, like either support vector or deep learning. Or deep learning, you just have to. Oh, I'm really not familiar with deep learning. I can try to read support vector and prepare for that. Yeah, now I think I will do chapter nine. <laughs> And we'll see how it goes with us. Because I'm very busy recently, so I don't have time for a book cup. <laughs> okay, so no one has questions. So we should meet again next week with Jeremy presenting the next chapter, which is next week will be. Three base methods, right? Hile, how are you doing? Are you okay? <laughs> yeah, I am okay. How are you? I mean, I'm sorry that I was late. I am quite busy these days. So yeah. last week, I totally, it got out of my mind that uh, I noticed that, oh, some days ago was Monday. <laughs> And yeah, I was not able to join after that. And today, I I mean, I just, yeah, today is Monday. And yeah, I was a little bit late again. Sorry for that. Oh, Thank so you. Nice. It was so nice. Yeah. Oh, we are running out of time. So I'll see you guys next week. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Have a nice day. Have a nice week.